when can I prove my roses? Um, I'd say middle of February, March, you're, you're good to go. And then I have other calls that say, I did get my roses planted, is it too late? No, it's not. Go ahead and prune them down. Do you want your main canes? And then feed. After you do that, it'll force you know, new growth so you get a really healthy plant. Can you speak um, a little louder? Yes. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I don't do mics. Um, I do, like I said, most of the maintenance on all the roses here. Uh, I use these nifty little clippers that I always have in my pocket. They work really great. Um, if you have bigger canes and you want the bigger... Sh show us those clippers again. The, no, the ones in your pocket. The ones in my pocket. I want, I want people to see how you don't stick yourself That's with a wine cork. Those are really good. And they don't make holes in my apron either. <laughs> yeah. I learned that from Patty. <laughs> so you want to start with the, the major pruning that they should be doing about March ish. Basically, yeah. you want to wait for your hard freezes to stop. Reason for that is because if you, we see this all the time, people who come to California where it's a little warmer, they're used to pruning in the fall, <laughs> and they'll go and, and prune, and then you get those hard freezes, and, and then uh, you'll end up with dieback. And then it endangers the graft. You're in danger of losing your, your roses. I've seen someone knock out a whole rose garden by doing exactly that. Um, also, sometimes you'll get tempted to do it, say, January. You know, you're just tired looking at dead stuff. And sometimes you get that warm spell that makes you think, oh, everything's coming to life. I need to do it before the new growth happens. Don't worry if it's leaping out. It's OK. Even if it's starting to form buds, if we get one of those really nice warm spells that we sometimes get, don't worry about it, you will not hurt it by cutting it after that, or cutting it when it's really leaked out. It won't hurt it. Um, it will actually do more damage. If you know we're going to get cold again and get more hard freezes, don't prune it yet so that you don't end up, because you'll, you'll cut it back and then freeze back, and then you'll cut out the, the damaged part, and now you're down to nothing. So, school of hard knocks here. <laughs> Yeah, every, just about everyone's had to learn that lesson the hard way. Um, these are these are heavy duty pruners, but the nice thing about these long handled ones, it allows you to get in you've got these thick thorny roses. It allows you to get in there and prune uh, without getting your hands in where all the thorns are. So I'm gonna let. Uh, Cheryl here to talk about how to actually do it. We get this question a lot, how to prune a rose. So I'll let you well, last year in Ken's class, he says there is no rule to how to prune. <laughs> you don't have to go to the five leaf. Um, you can just cut it off. It's going to grow. Um, I like to do right above where the leaf is uh, an angle, like a 45 degree angle. Um, usually on the bud, the leaves out. That way it'll leaf more that way. Um, try to get in and get all the yellow stuff out. Uh, any, any disease, you wanna make sure that you sterilize your food afterwards so you don't spread it to others. Um, if you have black spot or powdery mildew, that will spread on your prayers. Uh, Ella has a little bottle of alcohol that she carries with her. So when she's done with one bush, she can clean her pruners, and that way she doesn't spread the diseases to the other people. Other people, is that easy? There you go. Good. I normally carry these on my hip. So it was that easy. Keep them, keep them sterilized. Any questions? So yeah. alcohol is good enough to sterilize, you don't need bleach? It can be bleach water, it can be alcohol, <coughs> just something to that kills bacteria and fungus and things like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the, you want to tell them about the March pruning. March pruning. Which, which canes to take out. Yeah, yeah, you want to make sure you take all your cross, all your dead. Thanks. Down there. I don't think we have much of that. Yeah, but you up. can kind of. But you want sure. just your, get down to your graft and get your, just your main canes. You want to cut everything else off, all the leaves. So things that are crossing. Usually you've got a couple of uh, 
yeah, things that are going across each other. You want to kind of take this one out, probably. Make it nice and yeah. open. Yeah. Anything that's going towards the inside of the the, the bush. Um, anything that's uh, anything that looks like it's damaged, if it's discolored, purple, black. Take it out. That's when the heavy duty stuff comes in. Yeah. So how many canes do you want to leave, and do you want to take out older canes? Mm -hmm. The general rule, there is no hard fast rule, but well, Rosarians will tell you this, leave three to five canes um, if you want big flowers. Now this applies more to the basic hybrid teas um, and also the climbing roses. You know, leave it uh, approximately three to five canes because It'll make fewer flowers because it has fewer canes to put energy into. It'll put more energy into making the flowers bigger. If you have a, a bush that you want it to be thick and dense and full, that's good too. You can do that. Uh, make, it, it has a nice overall look that way. <coughs> and uh, you'll have lots of flowers. It might, may not be quite as big, but you'll have a lot more of it. So that's where the rule comes in. And how about the older canes? When they start looking like bark on the trees. Yeah. Go ahead and cut them out. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're just going to turn brown and get and die back <coughs> anyway, so you just go ahead and cut those out. Mm -hmm. I've seen some pretty complicated explanations for pruning. I've seen books that give you this five year process. Oh. What? <laughs> don't, don't let it get that complicated. It's not necessary. Sorry, yes. No, no. I, I've, I've had like 40 roses in California for years, but it's very different here than it is there. One of the things that I've always done is when I prune them, um, and I prune them fairly heavily, but I prune them, and I would always put alfalfa meal and Epsom salts. Or, you know, the alfalfa meal promotes the canes, and the Epsom promotes the leaves and the, the, the blooms. I can't find all, um, alfalfa meal here. Is there something that you... I don't know if it's because it attracts critters, um, or do you use that here, or is there something like alfalfa? So she's she's asking. Um, she hasn't seen alfalfa meal here. Alfalfa is a good fertilizer, um, good uh, nitrogen <coughs> provider. Um, there are other things that can be used as well. For example, this one. This is the food that we recommend the most. You see us push this a lot. This is something that we made specifically for our soil. We have a very um, unusual kind of soil here. We really do. Whether you whether you're in the sandy areas or the clay areas, there are certain problems that you're going to have no matter where you are. One of them is the pH. This has cotton seed meal. Okay, cotton seed meal is a little more acid because we have such a high pH. We need more acid food. Uh, in California, you bought two different foods probably. You had one for the acid lovers like your azaleas and your blueberries, and then you had another food for everything else yeah. because you had a high pH anyway. Um, here, we don't have acid soil. We have very alkaline. It's so alkaline, <coughs> it's almost sterile, okay? So we have to have acid foods because when the pH is too high, the plants have trouble taking up nutrients. And so uh, you want to acidify your soil with the sulfur. Okay. And then also using acid food, if the food itself is acidic, not just the soil, but the food itself um, has a, a better pH, the plant can take it up a lot better. So this is something, if you're planting in the ground, I recommend using the sulfur about once a year. And then also using an acidic fertilizer regularly. This one you have to use four times a year. Also, the, uh, the nice thing about uh, cottonseed meal, uh, and this is something again rosarians know. It, when when people are, are actually breeding rose and they're going to take them to show, cottonseed meal is what they feed the rose, no matter where they are, because it brings up more color. When you have when you bring that pH down, and when the food itself has a a better pH, it brings out the color in the roses. This is really important. You probably noticed certain flowers, especially the pink ones seem to wash out to white. If you've got Mexican primrose, if you've got pink roses, um, gara, you know, just all kinds of things. You've probably noticed all your pink flowers seem to look white. 
when they should be pink. If you can fix that pH and give them acidic food, you will notice they come back pinker. Also, feeding regularly is also important. Again, the pH affects how well the plant can take up nutrients, especially the nutrients it needs for the color and the flowers. So that's why you want to have a really good food. This is a complete food. It's got hot seed meal. It's also got bird guano in there. Um, it's got, um, it's, it's even got a little sulfur in there to help balance that pH a little more. It's got all kinds of good stuff. It's all just regular natural stuff. It's not like chemical crystals or anything. You open this up. I should have brought an open one so you can actually see it. It, it just looks like stuff, like almost dirt. Um, yeah, there's probably something right over there by the planting station. Um, a lot of you have already seen it. If not, come in and tell me and I'll show it to you. I'll show you an open container that we have out there. And uh, it's just natural stuff. And it brings out, it, it makes the, the plants healthier. Like I said, it's made for our soil here in, in northern Arizona. It's made for us, not for the East Coast, like most fertilizers are made for. Most of them are based on the East Coast. They're made for the East Coast. This is made for here. So give them a good fertilizer, use the sulfur once a year, and you will have the most amazing, healthy plants, amazing, beautiful flowers that have rich color. But just skip the alfalfa and the Epson and just go straight. Right. That's what I ended up doing because I couldn't find it, so I had that, so I did it. So yeah. I guess I did you also it. brought up the Epsom salt. Yeah. Epsom salt has a, is a natural source of magnesium. It's also salt. Like I said, we have more than enough salt in our ground already. We have salt in the water. Salt's really not good for plants. It sterilizes the soil. It burns the plants. Yeah. Hmm? I just bought some Epsom salt and it was magnesium sulfate. Yeah. Yeah, the, the adding Epsom salt, uh, again, you, it's a lot of salt. So, yeah, just try to get some more, like other magnesium uh, supplements. Magnesium is in here. So if you're using this, you've got everything you need. It's got the iron. We need a lot of iron in our soil. It's actually there, but the plants have trouble taking it up. It, it's it's just not accessible to the roots. Um, so there's iron in here. If you have problems with uh, plants yellowing, especially during winter and monsoon season, that's generally an iron deficiency. So be regular with your feeding, and you'll avoid those problems in the first place. And then you won't be rushing in here to to buy those supplements to try to get it back on track. So this has everything you need, takes all the guesswork out of it, you don't have to worry about supplementing with anything, just just this right here. And uh, like I said, it can be sulfur once a year. Can you use too much of the fertilizer? Can you use too much of the fertilizer? Can you over fertilize? It's kind of hard to, it's not as strong as the chemicals. Um, I mean, it's it's strong enough, but it's not it's less prone to burning. Let me put it that way, because of the fact that it's um, it doesn't dissolve all at once, um, and it's just just different. Okay. So it's something that I mean, yes, you can use too much of it. Yes, you can burn with it, but you kind of have to try at it. Um, it'll give you some basic directions here: how much to put on bushes, how much to put on trees, how much to put on grass has everything there. But um, once you've done it a few times, you stop measuring. And you just start grabbing it like a chicken scratch and tossing it. Because you kind of have an eye for how much should be on the soil visibly. So it, it's really, really easy to use. I don't measure. I just start sprinkling around the yard and, and all the containers. And I just do it all at once. And I don't measure a thing. Yeah, that's so. how I use it, too, but I didn't know it. You would, you would probably have to really overdo it. Uh, I mean, actually, pile, like have piles of the stuff in one place. You know, yeah, that would probably do something. But like I said, if you're at least just kind of sprinkling, and a little goes a long way with the stuff. It, especially for um, smaller plants, the trees will really eat it up because they're huge. That's a lot of branches and foliage to feed. But when it comes to smaller plants, shrubs. Perennials and grasses, a little goes a really long way with this stuff. Oh, I also find that after I'm done pruning, I'll feed them because they like to be fed after they're pruned, and in a couple weeks they look awesome. 
Yeah, oh, this, well. With this food, four times a year, once for each season, spring, summer, winter, fall. So um, again, as she was saying, you, right about when you're pruning, that's when it's about to, you know, it's, it's warming up, so the, the plant is about ready to push out a lot of new foliage, um, start making buds. It's going to eat up a lot of energy. Give it some food so it can do that. Otherwise, it'll be like, wait. <laughs> this, yes, go ahead. Feeding a tree just at the drip line? Yes, when you feed it a tree, put it at the drip line. That's where uh, the feeder roots are. Same goes for the rose bush, actually. For shrubs and trees, the, uh, there's basically, in the center coming uh, from the trunk, there's big, thick arterial roots. So those are just like the arteries in your body. Um, the arteries don't actually feed oxygen and nutrients to your body. They just carry it, you know, like a main line. Um, and then they come out here to the edge of the canopy. And that's where the feeder roots are, the, the roots that actually absorb water and nutrients, they're out here at the edge of the canopy. So uh, whether it's a tree or a shrub, wherever the edges of the plant are up here, that's where the feeder roots down there. So that's where you want to put the food with rose bushes, trees, anything you're feeding. This right here is superphosphate. Now the food we, we have actually does uh, make things Keeps them looking really good. But if you want to give them an extra punch, the super phosphate is really good stuff. Um, kind of, kind of use it sort of like the bone meal, but this one is way more effective, more efficient. I've always used bone meal myself. I would put it down in the fall. Bone meal takes forever to break down, so you have to put it down in the fall so it can kind of start working in the spring. Bones decay very slowly. They just do. So the super phosphate is faster acting. It's, a, it's, a, it's still a natural mineral. It's something they mine out. But it's, uh, it's just way faster acting. So I can put this on a plant now and see results very quickly. Um, like I said, I only always used uh, bone meal. And then I uh, talked to Candy. He's like, oh, no, you got to try the super phosphate. This stuff's faster. And it's more pungent. The bone meal is typically like a 0 to 0. This one's an 18. So twice as strong almost. That remote you look is age, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, the, every, every uh, fertilizer has three numbers on it, or fertilizer supplement. That's your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That middle number, phosphorus, that's what makes it blue. So, the super phosphate is an 18. That's a, that's a really high number for a natural product. Synthetics always have a crazy high numbers. So You'll see things like 20, 20, 20, or 20, 30, 50, you know, weird 20, 50, 30, or something like that. Um, you'll see really, really high numbers on synthetics. They don't work the same way as naturals. So on naturals, numbers are always lower. So you, like our all-purpose food here is 744. Those seem like really tiny numbers. Believe me, it's enough. So uh, the superphosphate for a natural, that's a really high number at 18. That's almost over, y'all. You will have more blooms than you know what to do with. You'll have big, big blooms, lots of color. I mean, it's going to really go all out for you when you give it that extra phosphorus. And that's what the superphosphate does. It's basically just a <coughs> mineral phosphorus. And this is something, like I said, it's so fast acting. Um, I never realized how fast acting it was until we were talking to Ken in his face. Yeah, and he said, yeah, if I've got a, a garden party coming up, if I'm going to have friends over to the house, I'll go and put this on the rose bushes and on the flowers. And by the time uh, everyone comes over that weekend, everything looks amazing. So it's like, wow, that's really fast acting. I didn't know it was that fast. So uh, this is uh, this is the, the flower power, but it lasts longer than the synthetic water-soluble uh, flowering uh, uh, chemical uh, fertilizers. That's what I'm looking for. So uh, it lasts longer than those, but it's just as fast acting as they are. Okay. Box. Do we have any more questions about fertilizer? Okay. So the first thing that comes.
comes to mind when we think roses and bugs is generally aphids. And also last year we saw some major problems with spider mites, not just on roses, but just plants in general. Actually, the roses did pretty good, but on plants in general. And so, uh, and thrift, really bad thrift. Sometimes you'll, you'll notice your, your roses, they seem singed on the edges of the petals. And uh, the bud seems to have trouble opening in them when they open, deformed or open. Yeah, it, it'll open, it almost looks um, like the, the edges of the petals have been burned. Sometimes it's so bad that it looks like something took a bite at it. It's that bad. Uh, that's thrip. It's a super tiny little insect, also known as the noceum. Yeah, because you don't see them, they're tiny. You have to have really good eyes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the noceum is uh, something that will get into the buds early on. You know, it, uh, here, this guy's safe. We have a bud here. When this starts cracking open and look, looking like this, that's when the thrip will get in. And they're small enough, they can get in between those petals and get to the petals that aren't exposed yet. And they'll start sucking the juices out of the edges of the petals. And then that's why when it opens up, it looks like the, the edges of the petals are singed. And then you'll end up with issues. They, they're especially common in the spring and again in the fall. They don't like the summer heat. So as soon as it warms up in the spring, that's when you'll see it. And then it'll stop in the summer and they'll be back when it cools down again. Uh, and then the aphids, those are the little teardrop insects. Very, very small, but if you have good eyes, you can see kind of long legs on them. Um, be green, brown, gray, every color in the spectrum. Really, <laughs> they come. They come out in a lot of shapes and sizes. A lot of aphids will actually specialize in certain types of plants. Yeah, they're they're big black tree aphids, quarter inch long, that like to get into uh, like firs and spruces. There are um, the ones that you see on roses are generally the green ones, but sometimes you also see gray, black, or uh, orange. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the most common are the little green <coughs> ones, and they love the new growth. They love to get on buds. You know, like these buds here, they'll get onto the buds and start attacking it before it's even open. They'll get onto new growth, um, new leaves as they're starting to form, and so then they start looking disfigured because they're being attacked by these bugs. Uh, so you'll see these, these insects getting onto the roses. The first thing I like to recommend is say, actually right about when you prune. When you do your, your major pruning, the first thing, say March, uh, after you're done pruning, spray it down with the um, dormant oil. And what this does is it smothers, and use this on the whole yard, not just the roses. Use it on the trees and the bushes and everything that's woody and still there. Put this, uh, spray this down on everything. What this does is it smothers insects, but it also smothers eggs. Because at that point, a lot of insects aren't really active yet. But there's eggs that are overwintering on the bark of the trees, of the shrubs. You can't see the eggs most of the time. But they're there, and they're, they tend to be kind of impervious to a lot of insecticides. So this is something that does work on eggs. This is something, as soon as you prune, you spray it down. It's something you can't use when it gets too hot. It's an oil, so it's a mineral oil. And it can burn if you use it when it's too hot. But it's great at that pruning time of the year. You can spray this uh, on, on everything. <coughs> it just smothers eggs so that they just don't even hatch out. So it's a, a major preventative. After that, uh, you'll be fine for a while until things fly in from other people's yards. <laughs> So then, when you get to that point, you start getting to your insecticides. Now there's a, a number of things that uh, can be used. Not all insecticides will work on aphids. Just about everything will work on thrip and spider mite. They're, I'd say every insecticide we sell, I think, works on both of those. Aphids are kind of resilient. They are. I mean, they're small, soft-bodied creatures. You'd think they'd be easy. Everything just kind of sloughs off of them. It's like they have this waxy <coughs> coating that repels everything. So you want to make sure you get an insecticide that does work on aphids. This is one of them. This is neem oil. It's a natural, organic, 
comes from the neem tree, um, has a natural, it, it's a neem tree's uh, natural defense against insects. And so we're using that for our other plants. It's not the fastest acting um, insecticide, but very effective. It's a very wide range of insects. Really, really good stuff. Um, and safe to use on things like vegetables, um, fruit trees, I mean everything. We have a lot of customers asking uh, for a concentrate version. We now have it. Um, so it's here, it's under the label Bondi, and it contains neem oil, and as an added bonus, we put in uh, pyrethrum, <coughs> which is a chrysanthemum extract. A little faster acting than, 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 than the neem. And so the two of them together get a very wide range of insects, a little faster acting than the neem by itself, and also neem is a natural fungicide as well. So between either of these, you'll pretty much just kill everything <laughs> that you want to kill. So this is something what, what I would recommend if you're having an issue with aphids and thrip, or if you know you are, because let's face it, if you have roses, a lot of times you will, is spray down the buds, okay? This isn't on, but you would spray the buds before they start cracking open or as they're cracking open. That way, um, it'll have a, an actual repellent effect for the thrip and the aphids that want to get in there and start attacking those buds. Um, if you already see them, spray them right away and it'll kill them. So that's a, a, a really, really effective way to take care of the roses. Also, we are now in the spring. It is April. Some of you have already started to see the mildew on some of your plants. I think we've had some uh, botinia come in with it. Yeah. A couple other things have started coming in. Um, this time of year, we have a higher than normal humidity level. Um, sometimes we even get spring rains, although this year we haven't been so lucky. <laughs> but uh, during this time of year, we get uh, fungus, you'll, you'll get, uh, it, it's called powdery mildew for a reason. It looks like a white powder that starts forming on the leaves. Sometimes you might get a, a red or black spot. That's also a, another type of fungus. Um, don't panic, it's perfectly curable. But you, can, you can prevent that by using a fungicide. Either ahead of time, actually fungus is one of those things that's a little harder to take care of once it's already started. It's easier to prevent. So if you know you're gonna get it, if you've had problems in the past especially, just do it. You know you're gonna get it, just spray the whole thing down with the fungicide. Uh, you can use the neem oil, you can use the, the copper, both of them are organic. Copper is really strong from the side. If you've already got it, probably go with a stronger one because this is really good stuff for that. Um, and then, it, like I said, if you see it, spray it. If you, if you typically have problems around this time of year, just do it before you see it so that you can prevent it. What about the Bayer 3-in-1? The Bayer 3-in-1 would, would be another one you can work. Any, any kind of fungicide. Any, any fungus. This goes for all of them. We also sell another one called Infuse. That we didn't bring it up here, but Infuse is a uh, systemic, meaning you spray it on the leaves, and the leaves actually kind of absorb it a little bit. It's a good one to use during times like, say, monsoon. Um, it's not something that you could use on edibles. Some people do eat their rose hips, so if you're one of them, you know, I, I don't think it's approved for, for edibles, but. Um, the infuse is a really good one to have in monsoon time because of the fact that the leaves absorb it and you can't wash off the leaves away. So that's a, a really good one for that time of year. Okay. Oh, I didn't uh, talk about our critters. <laughs> Natural way to go. Yeah, this is a, a, another way to, to go. Now, a lot of you are familiar with the ladybugs. We sell a lot of ladybugs and a lot of you come in with your kids and they can't say, mommy, I want the ladybugs. And so we saw a lot of ladybugs. Ladybugs love aphids and thrip, basically, and, and um, pretty much everything that attacks roses. There's only so many things that roses really have to deal with. Aphids, thrip, and mildew are basically the ones you have to deal with the most on roses. Uh, but 
ladybugs are just hungry, hungry little critters. I am. Yes. You can see they're, they're crawling around. They know it's spring. They're ready to, to go after them. We've seen the aphids. Um, they've been out for a while, so it is time. Um, the thrip will appear any day now. So I've seen thrip too. Yep, she, okay, she's seen the thrip. Yeah. So they're, they're they, out they there. put them out, do they, yeah. they breed? Yeah, they do. They, what you want to do with your ladybugs, first uh, go out in the evening, not the morning or the afternoon, but go out in the evening when it's getting dark, spray everything down, spray down the plants, the roses, you know, and then, and then release them. They don't fly during the night, so if you release them in the evening, it gives them time to kind of yeah, get to know their surroundings and settle in a little bit better instead of coming out of the container just flying off and and they're thirsty any, right now too, any so direction that's yeah that's so why you wet it down yeah wet it down otherwise they'll go away looking for water as soon as morning comes so wet it down give them a drink they're, they're going to be thirsty we do spray a little water on here every day so that they have a little something to drink so they don't dehydrate in there but uh, still the first thing that anybody or anything will do for survival is go looking for water when they find themselves in a new place. The, um, I do want to mention something. Every now and then someone comes in with a little baggie <laughs> with a bug inside that says, something's attacking my trees and shrubs and stuff. If you see a little black and red insect that looks like a little crocodile, okay, they're long on body. Yeah, kind of long bodied and the best, best way to describe it, it's got a tail like an alligator. Those are actually ladybugs, okay? They're the larva, the uh, adolescent form of the ladybug. I know it, it looks completely different from what you think of as a ladybug. And you might even look at it and think it's too big. It's bigger than the adult version. That's normal. That's just the way it is. Those are the... Um, larval form of the, the ladybug. And actually, their appetites are like three times as big when they're in that stage. They're just like teenagers, they <laughs> eat everything. So they're really great. So if you see them, don't kill them. <laughs> There's a, a the lacewing larva look very similar to. So if you see them, leave them alone. They know what they're doing. Um, this is another one. Uh, this is the praying mantids. Praying mantids are, uh, they're great hunters. They're great insect hunters. These are really good to have in the garden. They come in an egg form. And then when they hatch out, they, they look just like praying mantis, but they're really tiny. Really, really itty bitty. Kind of cute, actually, because they're, they're shaped just like the adult, but smaller. Um, these eggs, there's two egg sacs in each container. And each one contains, I think, between one and 200 uh, eggs in it. And so there's between two and four hundred eggs in here. So you've got a lot of uh, a lot of praying mantis in here. At first, you really won't see them as much because, like I said, they're really tiny. Uh, eventually, they do get big, and you know what a praying mantis looks like. I think we will see them. Usually by summer, they're they're good size. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're great hunters. They're less likely to fly away than the ladybugs. I I, I know. We, like I said, we sell a lot of ladybugs because they're cute. But the praying mantis is actually a really good choice. And when they get bigger, they're capable of eating small insects like the aphids and thrip, but they're also capable of getting larger insects. So it's it's a really good alternative to the ladybug. And then last but not least, nematodes. I can't show you what the nematodes look like, but there's a picture here from the microscope. Uh, there's a lot of different types of nematodes. These are beneficial nematodes. What these do is they attack the grubs in the soil. You know that uh, white, icky, worm thing? That it's, yeah, really gross looking. It's got a brown head, and white body, and they're typically kind of C-shaped. They kind of curl up on themselves. You find them in the soil. Great for fishing, yes. <laughs> the like them. Yeah, the chickens like them. Um, they like to attack the roots. They get in there, they'll eat away all the feeder roots. You'll suddenly see a plant die. This can go for trees, shrubs, anything. You'll suddenly see a plant die of dehydration, but you know it's getting enough water, but for some reason, it's dehydrating. What's happened is that the grubs are eating away at the feeder roots, and so it no longer has roots to take up water, and you see the whole plant fail. 
that's where the beneficial nematodes come in. You just take these, you can't see them, they're, too, they're microscopic, you can't see them. But uh, you'll, there'll be a container in there, take the contents of the container, mix it with water, and then water it into the soil. It's not a chemical, there's no dilution rate. Mix it with as much water as you need to spread it all around the yard and wherever you're seeing grubs. And within, say, a week, you're generally grub free. It's very fast acting, very effective, safe, will not harm you if you get it on your skin, won't, they won't attack mammals, they won't attack anything but grubs. They like grubs, that's all they're interested in. So these are safe to handle, safe to put in your vegetable garden, anywhere you've got grubs. Really, really effective, but organic control. How many, how many trees or shrubs will that box cover? I think the box says that it will go up to 2,000 square feet. Okay. So unless you have got a really big yard, so you can go around doing, you know, do your trees, do your shrubs, basically wherever you know they are. Um, if you're not sure that they're there or not, just treat it. Okay. Oh, yeah, we've covered just about everything. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Um, a couple weeks ago, we didn't have a light frost, but we got a hard freeze here on my so the will it branch out yeah. new yeah. buds? Yeah. His question was, um, and all the trees did this. Yeah. They started to leaf out, and then we got those freezes, and then all those tender new leaves. Twenty-seven. Just. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, kind of now they look like they're dead. It's okay. It's it's the same thing as when we get split ends. You cut them off, they grow back. You, know, you, you won't lose your hair because you cut off your split ends. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no. So. <laughs> <laughs> For some of the very, very All right. I think I've covered all the main points. I mean, we're going to um, just talk to you, just uh, just show you a few uh, companion plants that are in the garden center right now. Um, things that kind of add a little bit of interest all along with the roses. A classic rose garden isn't really considered complete without some herbs and flowers in there, really. I mean, we really, like those old cottage gardens, you had to have some, some, uh, some flowers. Lavender is a classic for rose gardens. I mean, the old European and cottage gardens always had a lavender fragrant. It's an herb and flowers. Purple always looks great with the roses, it really does. So, we've got a lot of uh, perennials in stock right now that have just come in. We've had trucks coming in like crazy, so I encourage you to go down to the perennial house and uh, take a look around. What was that white one you held up? The white one? This is Candy Tuft. Oh, okay. Or Iberus. You can find it under both names. Um, low growing. Kind of has an Alyssa look. But it's perennial. It's bigger too. Yeah, it's perennial. Okay. How about the garlic? Will that help repel the pollinators? Yes. Garlic. Yes. Um, planting plants that have a pungent smell again will will um, keep the javelina out. So things like society garlic or even edible garlic, planting those in among the areas where they're wanting to be can actually keep them out. The society garlic is really strong, so that's a really good one to have. Yeah, <laughs> very, very good one to have. I like garlic. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, cottage uh, carnation is the good one. This one, this is another one of those that's fast growing and will bloom like you would not believe. Next year, this thing will be three or four times as big, and it will actually have more flowers on it than you can count. I try to count. The, the flowers that I had on um, on my carnation last year, I got to like 56 and then it gave up yeah, counting. Just, I wouldn't even got that flower. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also we just got the uh, butterfly bush. This is actually a miniature. Only gets a couple feet tall and looks really fabulous. Yes? What kind of roses do well in containers? What kind of roses do well in containers? All of them. All of yeah. them. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, they do great. Some of the really big ones, you'll probably have to keep them trimmed down to a smaller size. And you'll want to feed a little more often because they, the nutrients drain out quickly. When you feed more often, do you feed a lot more lightly? No. Um, I think I do mine about four times a year with the all-purpose. 
Um, if it's a really small pot, then maybe go a little more often, like every six weeks instead of every three months. Um, but that's a, that's about it. Uh, I, I, I grow roses in containers myself. Uh, smaller pots, especially if they're getting watered more often, will leach their nutrients much faster. So, you know, feed, feed a little more often, especially on those. And big pots maybe four or five times a year. Okay, in all your handouts that you have, do you have one on fragrant roses particularly? Or do you just have to follow your nose? Oh, specifically on fragrance? That's when you come see me. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, we tried to bring up some fragrant roses here. We brought up, um, let's see, this one? This is Coretta. Where did you bring up double the Bible? Chrysler. Chrysler Imperial is a good one. What was that? Chrysler Imperial. Oh, okay. Right now. It's got a little bit of frost damage from the other night. But, uh, Pope John Paul II. I uh, had him in California, then I got one here last year. Yes. They're really good. Uh, Pope John is a really good one. Sugar Moon is another good white one. Angel Face. Angel Face is really good. Oh, okay. you just brought in a fragrant cloud the other Frigate day. Cloud. That's really oh, good. Yeah. Um, if you really perfume love the white, yeah. Perfume mm -hmm. White has a, a citrusy scent. Yeah. Scent. Which one was that last one? Uh, Firefighter has a, a really good scent. The David Austins, if you like fragrant roses, yes. you need to be looking at those old fashioned roses. Uh, the David Austin is a, a grower that specializes in the old world roses. Cabbage They are, they are mm -hmm. really, really fragrant. I've always wanted to try a David Austin, but never did. Do they do well here? Yeah, they do great here. I they have too. Somewhere in here I they have don't, They don't do well in California. No, they don't. Uh, they don't. They don't. Yeah, I tried that. They don't. Yeah. This is a David Austin. This one's called Gertrude Jekyll. This is one of my favorites. Really pretty pink flower. It's even got a good picture on there. Lots and lots of blooms. Very fragrant. This is that classic rose fragrance. If you want that true rose fragrance, Gertrude Jekyll's a great one. Other David Austins just have really great rose fragrance. So. These are, are really good, and we've got the, the Gertrude Jekyll in stock. So that's a really good one. Very strong. Let's see. Okay. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, call the class to an end, but we're here for questions. Um, Cheryl is, like I said, she's kind of our rose guru, so.